On behalf of the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science and Information Technology Osijek, Josip Juraj Strosmer University of Osijek, I would like to announce the Dean of the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science and Information Technology Osijek, full professor Drago Žagar to give a welcome speech. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, dear students, dear guests, let me first greet our dear guests. Professor Sonja Villa, Vice Rector of the University of Osijek and our technical co-sponsor. <laughs> Professor Gordon Gledec, Dean, and Professor Mislav Grgic, ex-Dean of the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing Zagreb, co-organizer of this conference. <laughs> Professor Ivan Samarjic, Rector of the University of Slavonski Brod, our co-organizer. Mr. Tomislav Krolo, representative of City of Osijek, City of Osijek. <laughs> Mr. Dragan Vulin, President of County Assembly of Osijek Baranja County. <laughs> I would also like to greet the representatives of this year's main industrial partner of the conference, Odašiljači i Veze Zagreb, and Mr. Mate Botica, director with the company. and also our gold partner this year, AKD, and Mr. Sertic. I also wish to greet representatives of other higher education institutions from Croatia and abroad, deans and vice deans. Representatives of all sponsors and donors of the conference, representatives of our partner institution from economy and local community, and all other dear guests. Please greet them all with an applause. It is our great pleasure to welcome you in occasion of the fourth International Conference on Smart System and Technologies 2020, organized and hosted by the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science and Information Technology, OSIC, Josip Jure Strosme, University of OSIC. It is my special pleasure that again this year our co-organizer organizers of the conference of Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing University of Zagreb and Faculty of Mechanical Engineering uh, ex University of Osijek now University of Slavonski Brod. The conference is technically co-sponsored and supported by many international and Croatian scientific professional and other organizations, institutions and companies especially by IEEE Region 8 and IEEE Croatia Section, Ministry of Science and Education, SIGRE, Croatian Academy of Engineering, and our university. I also wish to thank to other numerous sponsors, donors, and company supporters, especially our main industrial partner of the conference of the Šiljači i Veze Zagreb. After two years, this year we have respective number of papers that will be presented at the conference. In total, 37 accepted papers, 90 authors from 10 countries that are actively participating in the conference program. This year, the SST conference, despite these pandemic situations and new normal, continues to provide the participants opportunity to present and share their research results and exchange experiences in all aspects of smart system and technologies, both physical and virtual. Besides the 10 regular sessions, this year we have also four interesting workshops comprising different aspects of smart system and technologies. Furthermore, we have two technical lectures given by our main sponsors. And finally, we have two respective keynote lectures given yesterday by Professor Henry Muccini from the Department of Information Engineering, Computer Science and Mathematics, University of L'Aquila, and today, Professor Markus Rupp, Institute of Telecommunication, Technical University at Vienna. This year, we have also organized, collocated the fourth Cybersecurity Conference, CSC, with respective number of partners, very interesting lecture, roundtable, and many interesting presentations. Especially, I wish to thank all members of different committees, reviewers, and numerous volunteers. Without their support, this conference will not be successful. In addition, 
to the technical program of the conference. We hope that despite this situation, you will enjoy a social program of the conference uh, that we have organized during our, your stay in Osijek. I wish all of you productive and interesting conference and pleasant stay in Osijek and Croatia. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Vice Rector of Josip Juraj Slosmar University of Osijek, Professor Sonja Vila, and our technical co-sponsor. Thank you. Uh, dear esteemed guests, uh, dear colleagues and students, I am glad that I can greet you in the name of our rector, Professor Vlado Guberac, in the name of our university management and of course in my name. Uh, this year is special for the University uh, of Osijek because we celebrate 45 years of our existence. Today we have around 17,000 students uh, and uh, around 2,000 uh, employees. And our employees uh, work every day uh, very hard to fulfill our mission in education, in research, and in our contribution to the society. One of the activity uh, that is, we think, very important is organization of meetings, symposiums, uh, workshops. And uh, our faculties have a really good experience and a long tradition in organization, some of them for 40 years. Uh, uh, in our opinion, uh, these kind of meetings are uh, crucial for the exchange of knowledge of uh, new ideas, uh, of develop uh, development of new partnerships, and therefore university will always in the future uh, be a partner in this kind of, uh, of organization and help in uh, every uh, possible way. I'm also Really glad to see you uh, in live, not in online part of you. Uh, and I'm glad to uh, meet here despite of the COVID and, and, and pandemic uh, situation. And I really wish you successful and fruitful meeting and that uh, you have a very good work at the conference, but also some free time and uh, good that part of, of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Major of the City of Osijek, we will be greeted by the Head of the Administrative Department of for the Economy of the City of Osijek, Mr. Tomislav Krolo. Thank you. Good morning. I'm honored to greet you all on behalf of Mayor of the City of Osijek, Mr. Verkic and myself. Congratulations to FERIT on organizing this conference that brings uh, smart systems and technologies experts to OSEC. Dear conference guests that are visiting OSEC just uh, specially for, for this conference, I wish you a warm welcome to OSEC and Slavonia and to all your conference attendees. I wish you a pleasant stay and a successful conference. Thank you. I would like to invite Head of Osijek Baranja Assembly, Mr. Dragan Bulin. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and participants on this conference, it is my great honor and privilege to greet you on behalf of Osijek Baranja County, on behalf of uh, Osijek Baranja County Prefect, Mr. Anšić, and also I wish you all a warm welcome to the city of Osijek and Osijek Baranja County and to the Republic of Croatia. I know there is uh, there are a lot of uh, people who are watching through the online system this conference, and I really hope that the next year on the fifth international conference all of them could be here with us in, in Osijek and in Osijek Baranja County in the Republic of Croatia. I think that uh, this conference, international conference on uh, smart systems and technologies is very important for us, for the Osijek Baranja County, of course, for 
the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science and Information Technology because as we could already uh, hear that uh, really experts from this field are coming and attending this conference and of course this is very important. I wish you all a pleasant stay in Osijek, of course for those who are uh, watching us online, uh, they, they unfortunately uh, could not uh, enjoy in Osijek in, in, uh, our, in that, uh, that our hosts prepared for this uh, conference and uh, of course I hope and, and I believe that uh, you will make uh, a lot of useful contacts but not, not the physical ones in this conference and it would be useful for us and for you in, in, our, in our future. So uh, once again I wish you a pleasant stay, I wish you a good uh, conference and uh, I hope we will see each other next year on the fifth conference and uh, in a bigger number of participants. Thank you once more. Thank you. I would like to invite Dean of Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing, University of Zagreb, Professor Gordon Gledes, our co-organizer. Good morning. Drago asked me for a short speech, and you will agree with me, it's very difficult for a university professor to give short speeches since we are all accustomed to 45 minutes time slots. But I will try anyway. It's a great both professional as a dean and a personal privilege for me to welcome and greet you all at this conference. Uh, if you look at the names of programming committee and steering committee, you'll see a lot of names from, from FAIR, which is a clear indication and a clear sign of great and deep cooperation, professional cooperation that we have uh, uh, between our faculties. Also, there's a lot of personal connections and friendships that uh, stem from this cooperation. And I'm sure we have worked along uh, ever since the faculty affair it was uh, established. We have worked together at the benefit of the, of the whole country and I'm sure we'll keep it that way along with other technical faculties, namely Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and all the other technical faculties in Croatia in developing uh, our ideas, our common goals and uh, serve to the benefit of the people of, the, of Croatia. So. Uh, I hope this conference will continue to be excellent uh, as until now, and thank you for your time. Thank you. I would like to invite the Rector of University of Slavonski Brod, Professor Ivan Samardzic, as a representative of the Mechanical Faculty of Slavonski Brod, our co-organizer. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to greet you on behalf of students and employees of uh, University of Slavonski Broad, the youngest university in Rep Republic Croatia. Uh, our constituent part, Mechanical Engineering Faculty, is partner in this project, uh, in this conference, and I would like to gratitude to Ferit on this partnership. Uh, uh, I, wish, I, would, I, I would like also to uh, wish you very uh, fruitful, very successful work during this uh, conference and to enjoy in the heart of uh, uh, Slavonia and City Osijek. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. On behalf of the IEEE Croatia section and Croatian Academy of Engineering, we will be great, uh, greeted by the Professor Mislav Grgic. Thank you, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to give welcome greetings on the opening of this fourth edition of the International Conference on Smart Systems and Technology, SST 2020. I welcome you on behalf of the IEEE Croatia section and our chair, Professor Maja Matijašević, and also on behalf of our Croatian Academy of Engineering, uh, and our Academy President, Professor Vladimir Androcez. So both institutions are very, really glad uh, to support this, we can say, traditional conference uh, that is organized in Osijek 
and uh, we would like to thank the organizers for their efforts to organize this conference, especially in this, let's say, challenging year. Uh, so, uh, on this place, I would like to thank the general chair, Professor Drago Jagar, who is also the dean of the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science and Information Technology of the University of Osip Juraj Trosmer in Osijek. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the program co-chairs, and uh, this is uh, Professor Goran Martinovic uh, and Snežana Rimac Drlje. Then I would like to thank the registration chair, Professor Kruno Milicevic, Publication Chair, Professor Irena Galic, uh, and Publicity Web Co-Chairs, uh, Daniel Topic and Josip Balen. Thank you all. So finally, I wish you a productive and successful event, constructive discussions, and a happy and enjoyable stay in this beautiful, and I need to say, my hometown, Osijek. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite the director of the management board of Odashiljaci and Veze DOO, the main industrial partner of the Inter International Conference on Smart Systems and Technologies 2020, Mr. Mato Botica. So, good morning, everybody. Just one mistake I'm Mate Botica, no Mate. <laughs> Never mind. So this speech is without any preparations, and so it will be very short. Just to tell you everybody, uh, I am very proud that we are uh, this year industrial partner of this conference, and I am very proud that uh, I am uh, in this conference today. And uh, thank you for Mr. Jagar for invitation. I know that uh, we have a lot of topics today and I wish you all a very successful work today, and uh, I will be that we stay in touch in the future for a long time. Thank you very much. I apologize for my mistake. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is the end of the opening ceremony. I'm thankful to all the guests uh, of honor and participants of this ceremony. Uh, enjoy the conference. Dear colleagues, dear guests, it is my great pleasure and honor to announce uh, today's keynote speaker, Professor Marco Strupp, uh, from Technische Universite Universität Wien, Austria, uh, Institute of Telecommunications. Marco Strupp received his diploma degree at the University of Saarbrücken, Germany, and his uh, doctoral degree uh, at the Technische Universität Darmstadt, Germany, where he worked with Eberhard Hensler on designing new algorithms for acoustical and electrical echo compensation. Uh, he had a postdoctoral position at the University of Santa Barbara, California, with Sanjit Mitra, where he worked with Ali H. Said on a robustness description of adaptive filters with impact on neural networks and active noise control. From 1995 until uh, 2001, he was a member of technical staff in the wireless technology research department of Bell Laboratories at uh, Crawford Hill, New York, where he worked on various topics related to adaptive equalization and rapid implementation, including the first MIMO prototype for UMTS, as well as the first uh, Wi-Fi prototypes. Since October 2001, he is a full professor for digital signal processing in mobile communications at the Vienna University of Technology, where he founded the Christian Doppel Laboratory for Design Methodology of Signal Processing Algorithms in 2002, and the Institute for, at the, at the Institute for Communications and uh, Radio Frequency Engineering, now Institute of Telecommunications. He served as dean from 2005 to to 2007 and 2016 to 2019, as well as head of institute from 2014 to 2015. From 2015 to 2019, he had a joint agreement with Technici Technical University Brno, Czech Republic, supervising the wireless communication group there. He was associate editor of IT written sections of signal processing from 2002 to 2005, Eurocip 
Journal of Embedded, uh, Embedded Systems from 2004 to 2019 and is curr currently Associate Editor of URCP Journal of Advances in Signal Processing. He was elected ADCO member of EURCIP from 2004 to 2020 and served as president of EURCIP from 2009 to 2010. Professor Rupp authored and co-authored more than 600 scientific papers and patents, patents on uh, adaptive filtering, wireless communications and rapid prototyping as well as automatic design methods. Today. He will give us a speech entitled Wireless Communications of the Future. Unfortunately, Professor Rupp, uh, due to COVID, COVID uh, pandemic, uh, could not come to OSIEC, but he is with us online. Uh, good morning, Professor Rupp. Morning. Welcome to SST 2020 conference. Thank you very much. Uh, so, do you want to? To say something before a presentation to audience. Yeah, well, I'm I'm very thankful that uh, you invited me, uh, and uh, I'm, I feel really sad that I cannot be there in person because uh, I uh, was looking forward to, to uh, visit you in Osijek. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think this year it will not happen. Uh, I hope we can uh, do it in, in, the, in the near future. Yes, I hope. Also, so please uh, give us your speech. Thank you very much, and uh, let me um, see if I can share my screen now. Welcome everybody to my talk at the International Conference on Smart Systems and Technologies 2020. It is an honor to give a presentation about our work at this occasion, and I like to cordially. Thanks, Nezana, for inviting me. I was asked also to talk a bit about 5G health issues. And although not an expert on health, I can certainly provide you with some insight. My presentation will thus start by this issue, and then I provide you with some of the results of my PhD student, Bashar Tahir, who I mentioned as co-author on the front page. My slides always end with a list of publications from our group, including links to our publication database, so that you can find them very quickly in case you want to read more. Let's start with health issues. We are often exposed to alarming news when new technologies are coming out. When George Stevenson developed his steam engine for running a locomotive with wagons roughly 200 years ago, People claimed the end of the world and that the cows uh, will give sour milk once such a locomotive would pass by. Obviously, neither of that happened. Although understanding technical issues, even we engineers are often overwhelmed by the life-threatening statements we are exposed to. And as we do not have a medical or better biological expertise, we often cannot say whether such statements are true or at least have some truth in them. Let me give you a first example. On YouTube, you can find numerous videos that show how to cook an egg or heat popcorn with the help of a cell phone. It is understandable that non-technical people may believe such nonsense, but we engineers have learned how to calculate. So, let's calculate. A typical cell phone battery offers 2.6 ampere hours at 3.7 volt. This makes it roughly 9 watt hours. At best, around 10% of that can be converted into an electromagnetic wave, thus about 3000 watt seconds. To increase the temperature of an egg with 65 grams weight, we need about 200 joules or 200 watt seconds. Assuming, <coughs> assuming that the egg would absorb the entire electromagnetic wave, which it cannot due to its geometry, it could gain maximally 15 Kelvin and then the entire battery of the cell phone would be gone. 
assuming 300 milliwatt of electromagnetic power radiation, the entire process would take two and a half hours. Let me give you a second example. The so-called reflex study that was taking place in 2015-16 at the Medical University in Vienna. It worked with double-blind methods to evaluate the relation of electromagnetic waves on the corruption of DNA strings and came to the conclusion that electromagnetic waves originating from a cell phone could do so. However, journalists found out that the study was deliberately forged by some of the employees. The results could not be repeated by any other independent group so far. With the fifth generation, a new hype of hysteria came up in particular with the corona pandemic. In Great Britain, people set 5G base stations on fire as they believed they would support the spread of the coronavirus. At the time, most of the base stations were not even active. On the other hand, due to the new massive MIMO technology in 5G, we expect to substantially lower the radiated power to a tenth or even 1% of the previous levels. Less power means less energy consumption and thus less CO2 emissions. Users experience 10 to 100 times higher data rate for the same price as before. Still many voices are raised against 5G. You may wonder who profits from false statements. None of the presented claims could ever be validated. The World Health Organization categorized cell phones along in the same risk category as black coffee. If there is smoke, there is fire. If someone one shouts loud enough, there must be something dangerous out there. What is real is the fear. The fear is a fact. Against fear, there's hardly a remedy. If there is the fear of a threat and you can make it visible, it is there. If there is a fear of a threat and it cannot be made visible, possibly because it simply does not exist, the fear still remains. It becomes a very subjective matter. Have a look at this picture. Would you believe in A or in B? Yeah, judge yourself. Before I start with the technical part, let me quickly explain uh, how the wireless communication groups at Technical University of Vienna look like. Um, we have uh, several leaders here. One of them is uh, Christoph Mecklenbreuker, who is an expert in vehicular wireless communications. Then myself as expert in signal processing and wireless communications. Uh, then we have an assistant professor, Stefan Schwarz, uh, who is the head of the Christian Doppler lab, um, which I will explain in more detail. In the next slides, and eventually a uh, senior scientist, Philip Svoboda, uh, who is responsible for all the experimental work and core measurements. These Christian Doppler labs are an interesting concept in uh, which um, um, you have research subsidized by uh, the government in such a way that uh, you need um, uh, industrial partners. Uh, here we have uh, Nokia, A1, the service provider in Vienna, um, uh, ÖBB. Uh, we used also to have Katrain, but uh, eventually uh, this uh, collaboration came to a stop as they were taken over by Ericsson. Um, and um, these partners uh, finance uh, this uh, Christian Doppler lab but um, there is a co-financing of 50% by the government so that the cost for the partners is relatively low. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have a large enough group that uh, sustains for up to seven years uh, that uh, can focus on a specific uh, advanced uh, future uh, communication work.
so here this Christian Doppler lab is called uh, lab for dependable wireless connectivity for the society in motion and uh, very clearly what we are using is 5G and beyond mobile communications uh, we uh, um, address here this uh, very modern uh, motion in the society uh, that uh, everybody is on the move in particular in a large urbanization setting uh, and uh, all these um, users are somewhat dependable uh, and the quality uh, and the, the services they are taken not only wireless services uh, are very much uh, reliable and dependable on uh, the scenarios in which they are here we see it a little bit more in detail what kind of uh, typical urban scenarios we have here uh, there is this topic of seamless mobility uh, where um, the, uh, uh, for example, along a, a railway track or subway track, uh, you have uh, you see a lot of handovers, but uh, uh, you have to ensure that uh, the customer doesn't see them really. Uh, for uh, the customer, it looks like a continuous. Uh, stream of, of data or video, for example, uh, along uh, the movement uh, of the subway. Uh, and in particular, uh, with transportation, uh, there's a lot of uh, security, safety issues that needs to be uh, taken into account. So here we talk a lot, uh, about connected sensors, devices, uh, big data that need to be exchanged, uh, and um, also uh, the situation that um, we may have a large density uh, of uh, users uh, at a certain spot and these spots are even moving. Uh, this is also addressed by vehicular communications, particularly uh, because here road safety is what uh, is in, in the um, focus and uh, there's a very strong dependability of the neighboring cars, for example. And then also we talk about autonomous devices um, because uh, here um, we uh, expect in the future that uh, we have uh, more and more um, aspects of self-driving uh, cars, for example, or vehicles. Uh, we even have uh, self-driving buses now in Vienna. Uh, that uh, need to be taken uh, into account uh, so that uh, the safety is guaranteed, in particular if you have pedestrians or bicyclists uh, among them uh, who are typically not uh, being equipped with uh, any of these sensor data. What is the methodology in such a, such a Christian Doppler lab? Uh, we basically have uh, three major parts. One is measurements, one is link level, one is system level. And uh, they are um, combining with each other, one supporting the other. So typically we do measurements, for example, now a lot of measurements are done in millimeter wave technology at 60 gigahertz or 26 gigahertz. And uh, from these basic experiments, we learn a lot about the channel characteristics and how the waves propagate. And uh, this uh, then in turn goes into the link level simulation in form of a mathematical abstraction. So this is how we find uh, mathematical abstractions uh, that are uh, very much in detail explained in such link level simulation. In link level simulations, you can typically uh, model uh, very few, one or two base stations, maybe three, uh, and uh, a few users, maybe five or uh, even ten, but not more than that, because you have a lot of details, uh, granularity in these descriptions, and uh, if you uh, try to simulate that, it uh, eats up a lot of complexity. Uh, therefore, uh, we also have a so-called system level simulator uh, that abstracts these link levels based on our knowledge in the link level. Um, a lot of details like uh, hybrid ARQ um, and uh, the coding and so on that is uh, involved in such a link uh, is uh, basically uh, formulated by a simple line of code in, the, in a system level uh, 
scenario, but it uh, maps uh, from a signal to noise ratio, signal to interference ratio, exactly what the link level does. So by this, uh, we are able to uh, describe now scenarios with hundreds of base stations, thousands of users, and uh, you can even integrate that in uh, maps uh, of the environment, uh, often open street maps are available uh, digitally, so you can uh, directly load the map and uh, uh, position your uh, base stations and users and then uh, try to optimize uh, the behavior of such uh, networks. Uh, of course, there's many, many people involved in uh, such a uh, Christian Doppler lab, uh, many PhD students, uh, but also master students, and uh, eventually uh, there is uh, PhDs uh, coming out there that are typically then leaving us, going to industry. Some of them are even staying on as a postdoc uh, for for later. Let us now move on to the more technical part of this talk on wireless communications for autonomously moving systems. We find such systems in form of robots finding their way through an industrial environment such as an assembly lines or halls. We also find them in form of autonomous driving cars which is very challenging as lives are at risk. Both applications have in common that they require a continuous communication with neighbors as well as a coordinating station. Thus a large and limited bandwidth is required with harsh constraints on low latency transmissions. As the bandwidth is a limited resource, we are interested in solutions that do not require larger bandwidth. A potential solution for this is the so-called NOMA technology, non-orthogonal multiple access. In this scenario, we can see many cars in the street, all being communicating with the nearby base station. However, on top of such communication is also a NOMA transmission with very low power as only the nearby neighbors are to receive them. They are needed for the cars to coordinate with their neighbors and ensure safe driving. Such information is permanently required and needs to be at low delay while the communication to the base station can be discontinuous and for many services a certain delay can be tolerable. Also, a car such as shown here around the corner who may not receive the signal from the base station as it may be covered by some big building on the corner can be detected by the others and taken into account. What we propose here is a hybrid network, which is a superposition of a centralized network with help of a base station and an ad hoc network that is formed by the neighboring cars. As they use the same band to transmit their information, the overall bandwidth is not increased at all. In order to understand a NOMA transmission, let us explain how a classic OMA, an orthogonal multiple access, works. Let us assume a base station serves two users UE1, which is nearby, and a UE2 that is on the cell edge. The base station therefore utilizes frequency resources, a certain bandwidth for the UE1 signal and additionally a bandwidth for the UE2 signal. UE1 receives both signals and discards the UE2 signal for decoding its own signal. UE2 works similarly. Now let's do it in a NOMA fashion. In this case, the signals for UE1 and UE2 are superimposed. As UE1 is nearby, does not need much power to be transmitted for, while a lot of power is required as UE2 is on the cell edge. UE1 thus receives a strong UE2 signal that it can detect and decode first. It subtracts the signal from the received signal and what remains is the signal for UE1 that it now decodes. For UE2 not much has changed as the UE1 signal is small. It decodes its signal under a little bit more corruption as before. How does it work? Very simple in fact. Here on the example of 4QAM a second small 4QAM signal is superimposed. 
Typically, the small signal is not very strong and causes only little corruption in the four signal constellation points. The figure here thus exaggerates. Is this all future ideas? Not at all. A simple power noma concept was already specified in 3GPP in releases 13 and 14. Three different power levels were defined for this. It is called MUST, multi-user superposition transmission. We understand, however, by now that there is also more clever methods than power noma, so-called code noma techniques that combine the signal in a code rather than in a power domain and that can use the resources even more efficiently. Let me give you another example, this time with three users, UE1 and UE2 relatively close to the base station, UE3 far off. If we use a classical OMA transmission, as it is being used in LTE today, we obtain the following throughput rates for the three users, indicated in green, blue and red column. Let us now do it with NOMA, in which we superimpose the signal users UE2 and UE3. UE1 thus remains unchanged. The UE2 signal now can have a much higher data rate at the expense of the UE3 signal. But note that the small drop of UE3 is only due to the fact that only 4 QAM is allowed in 3GPP, before we could use 16 QAM and achieve a slightly higher data rate. In any case, the sum rate is much larger now. We gain more than 10% depending on the operational point, even though 3GPP does not give us much freedom in selecting the optimal signal constellation. In the next example, we consider a larger amount of users in the uplink. In an OMA system, we can reuse the frequency resources due to segmented antennas. This is shown here for example in UE1 and UE4, which are far off in different directions. With code NOMA, we are able to serve these six users with much less bandwidth resources, simply assigning each one a different signature. This allows a ground-free access with very low latency. Ground-free means that we do not need a specific protocol to follow in order to avoid collisions as we take the presence of collisions as given. Designing such a code NOMA system is not straightforward, as we need to design signatures with very low cross-correlation. Such signatures are not orthogonal, as we do not have an OMA system. An OMA system would not allow for such high data rate, as the resources would be shared among the users. In this publication here, we explain how to design systematically such low cross-correlation signature codes. The, the concept is thus once we have the NOMA signatures, we assume up to k users that transmit at the same time. Let us assume each of the users transmits with different power PK and we employ NR receive antennas at the base station. We can then describe the entire receive signal by a Katri Rao product of channel weights with the signature signals followed by a diagonal structured matrix that contains the transmit powers and also additive noise. For detection, we like to have a low complexity solution, thus if possible a matched filter. If not good enough in quality, we may have to employ an MMSE filter. We will use a parallel interference cancellation scheme that has low complexity and low latency with a few iterations of turbo decoding. I now like to set your attention to such a scenario here in uh, which we have a so-called intelligent reflected surface uh, that uh, is supposed to help us uh, in, in the transmission of uh, the users. So here in a simple scenario, we have two users. One uh, is uh, close to the base station, one is further off. Both are uh, being addressed by NOMA uh, transmission, so in the same band. But uh, we would uh, like uh, them uh, to um, 
uh, improve uh, the quality of the link, in particular for UE2, uh, as UE2 is further away, and uh, by um, properly um, programming this uh, intelligent reflected surface, uh, we hope that we establish a second path uh, so that uh, combined with the first path, uh, this would uh, now result in a better reception. But of course, uh, this would also uh, have an impact on UE1. Uh, and it may be that uh, the uh, reception for UE1 is worsened uh, by this. That means uh, we still have to find uh, what is the optimal setup here. We assume that at the base station uh, we have a superposition of both of the UEs, UE1 and UE2, uh, plus additive noise, as uh, we can see here in this relatively lengthy equation. Each of the UEs, uh, UE1 and UE2, um, have a direct path connection and one that goes over this intelligent reflecting surface. And by properly selecting the phase terms, these are here shown as phi, uh, we hope uh, to improve uh, the transmission from UE2. So uh, essentially the phase would be selected so that uh, together with H2, uh, we form a phi G2 term that is phase aligned. But if we do that, uh, we may uh, corrupt H1 because it may not be phase aligned with G1. Uh, so we wonder uh, in which sense we can improve uh, now by properly selecting phi. Here we see the outage probability for the two users uh, in a scenario where we transmit with 30 dBm, so relatively um, low power, one watt, uh, but high for a small device. So therefore, we call it a high SNR case uh, in context of, of such a small device. Um, what we recognize here in these curves is uh, that uh, certainly UE1 is uh, received much stronger than UE2, which is to expect. Um, never, uh, although we use NOMA, um, the um, UE2 that is further away is not being received uh, so exactly uh, so well. Uh, but uh, we also recognize here uh, simulations on top of uh, our predictions, our mathematical predictions, that we are very uh, doing very well, in fact. Uh, and uh, the prediction is based on uh, the assumption that these terms sum up to a gamma distribution. So obviously, this assumption holds quite well. Um, what you also see, if you look very carefully into these graphs, uh, you see 95% confidence intervals. And in most cases, they are so small that the points are really points. So uh, even though there may be fluctuation, but averaging this out, uh, these points are certainly at these positions here. Now, what happens if we switch on our reflected surface? Now, here we maximize for UE1. That would be uh, the um, UE that is close to the base station. And of course, what we see here is that UE1 improves substantially, but also UE2 improves. So very nicely uh, as a uh, additional effect, uh, both of them uh, have now a better reception. It would be, of course, make more sense to favor UE2 since UE2 is further away. Let's see what happens if we do that. Then uh, UE2 improves considerably, con uh, improves uh, mostly also for, for very low as an INR also compared to the first case, uh, but also UE1 improves here. So um, um, strengthening the weakest link, UE2, may be a very good um, strategy in this scenario. Now you may wonder uh, what happens if uh, they do not transmit with uh, 30 dBm uh, and therefore we run a simulation with only 20 dBm, uh, so 100 milliwatt, which is a, a lot more realistic. 
uh, in this scenario. And what we can recognize uh, again is uh, that uh, we can have a uh, um, strong improvement uh, in uh, these scenarios. Uh, now, um, whether we further UE1 or strengthen UE2 doesn't matter so much anymore. Uh, of course, there is a, a, a significant uh, difference visible, uh, but uh, the distances are not so big anymore. In both cases, uh, both UEs win and gain uh, a lot on quality. Uh, and again, uh, we could describe by our theoretical approach very well what happens here. So we seem to understand quite well um, how to uh, describe these um, behaviors with very modern um, devices. Uh, we can expect uh, such devices to show up uh, in the sixth or even seventh generation wireless. Uh, this is too early to say. We just started an EU project that will run over four years to investigate uh, the potential of such new technology. Another very exciting uh, technology that is very likely a major point in the sixth generation communication is to combine uh, localization data with transmission. If we move into millimeter waves, for example, at 60 gigahertz, uh, we can easily use the same transmission reception scenarios, not only for high data rates and low latency data rates, but also to localize the environment around us. So this would help, for example, cars to figure out if there is pedestrians nearby or cyclists or other cars, they may around the, be around the corner that they that they are not visible. But for example, by uh, modern um, active traffic lights that would scan the area around the crossing sections and distribute this information to the nearby cars, everybody could clearly see who is behind the corner, and uh, by this a lot of safety could be gained in the future. So we expect uh, with this combination uh, of uh, four millimeter ways of localization and data transmission, an interesting boost in particular in, in traffic and autonomous driving. To conclude my talk, let me state that I believe in 20 years from now, the wireless world will look very different than today, which will call for really big changes in the way we consider communications. The big challenges for the future are security, security and security. As we rely more and more on a working communication technology, we need to ensure that no one can hack into them and force our car to crash into another one or simply switch off the entire power supply of a city. But also, and related to this, is decentralization modes in communication. What if the backbone fails and the base stations are no longer supported by fresh information? Should we all stop then and wait until a solution is found? Or can we keep moving maybe with less speed and a bit more careful, but certainly safe? I would say, let's get started to work on such challenges. Thank you for listening and uh, I'm welcome to take some questions. Okay. Thank you, Professor Rupp, for this uh, very interesting presentation and for giving us a look at what awaits us in the future. Uh, we will uh, make available link to your presentation so um, a participant can uh, look closely to the literature and find out maybe a little bit more uh, these interesting things. Um, does anyone in the, in the audience uh, have any question for Professor Rupp? Uh, well, if not, uh, I have some questions, but I will uh, put on one. Um, the NOMA uh, is very promising technology uh, for future communication challenges. 
But for me, it's uh, the most interesting, maybe, or, or one of the inter most interesting things is uh, that the concept of intelligent reflection uh, surfaces. Uh, so, uh, could you uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about that surface? It's about that is uh, its design and maybe um, uh, where they would be uh, located, and maybe some. Examples, please. Yeah, well, that's of course it's a very new technology that uh, just started to evolve. Um, we are starting the new EU project with the partners in Europe uh, on this in December, and it will run for four years. So uh, I wish we would be four years further so that I can give more detailed answers. At the moment, what I can say is that. Um, we look into uh, material that can be controlled. Uh, for example, if you are in, in uh, RF circuitry, uh, you understand there's something like a Varactyl diet that can be switched on and off. And by this, you can simply change the reflection uh, of a antenna. Now, if you build uh, such a surface out of many antennas, let's say a two-dimensional antenna array, uh, of uh, relatively small elements, then uh, you have a whole surface uh, that you can control. You control each element individually or all together. And uh, a simple uh, idea is to look at an incoming wave, let's say from an IoT device, uh, that you would not reflect conventionally, uh, but in a controlled way. So you could change the angle of departure uh, uh, away from what is classically uh, expected by Snell's law. And um, uh, this is expected to um, be possible with relatively low energy uh, that you uh, put into uh, these surfaces, uh, but nevertheless you need a little bit of energy. You also need to control them, that means you also need uh, a connection uh, with uh, some information stream um, that uh, is controlled by the base station, uh, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. Uh, so we see a lot of challenging coming up here, but uh, if you can produce this in um, a form of a transparency, uh, like a wallpaper that you can put on the walls of buildings in a relatively large area, um, it, it would not be really visible, yeah, it should, can be painted white, for example, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, then you have a whole surface from, let's say, from a big building uh, that you can uh, change dynamically depending on what the uh, uh, resources nearby need to have. And by this, uh, you can um, distribute your limited resources uh, more efficiently uh, and then have um, a higher amount of users with, with high data. Thank you. That's another way of uh, looking at smart buildings. We have also smart walls of buildings. Um, thank you. Maybe some other question? Okay, thank you again, and I hope that we will see you in Osijek soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.